Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah called Jesus the Prince of Peace. I even was listening to a rabbi one time, and he called Jesus the Apostle of Peace. And Jesus said, Peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but as I give. Now in our text he says the opposite. Do you think that I've come to bring peace on earth? No. I tell you, I have come to give division. Is this a contradiction? Does the Bible contradict itself? Well, in John chapter 6 we read, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. And the text continues by saying, Many said of his disciples, This is a harsh saying. Who can listen to it? And it goes on to say, From that time on, Many of his disciples would follow him no more. So, there are some things in the Bible that appear to be contradictory. There are some things that are harsh. There are some things that are difficult to believe, and there are some people who don't want to recognize that. Years ago, a woman was upset with the way I was handling a problem, a problem, I might add, which the other pastor who preceded me couldn't handle, and that same problem drove him out of the church. So she called me up because she didn't like what I was doing, and she said, Pastor, I wish you were more like Jesus. And I said, you know, well, something, you're right. I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm going to pick me up a whip and drive those hypocrites out. She said, no, not that Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you something. There's only one Jesus. The same Jesus who said, you bunch of hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs, also said, come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, how do we handle this gospel lesson? Namely, that he did not come to bring peace, but division. And the answer lies in properly understanding what he said. He said, from now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, two against three and three against four. Let's let St. Paul explain that to us. He says, what we preach is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. In other words, the message of the gospel goes out. Some people hear it and believe it and have peace. Some people hear it and reject it and don't have peace. The Jews put aside most of the Old Testament prophecies and instead they set up their own idea. When the Messiah comes, he'll be strong, he'll be on a charger, he'll drive out the Romans and give us peace. And most of all, he will follow our religion as we have devolved it. He didn't do that. To the Gentiles, they didn't have the Old Testament. And so they were unfamiliar with the idea of humility rather than strength and bravery. The very idea that somebody would die for his enemies was repugnant to them. And the idea that a man would be crucified, dead, and buried, lay there for three days, and then come back, well, they never saw that before, and so it could not be true. To those with closed minds, the message is not neutral. It is offensive. It drives them mad. In my experience with atheists, when I try to share my faith with them, it's not, oh, I see what you're saying. You have your opinion, and I have, no. They usually are very hostile. I've met a few that, a very few that say, oh, okay, I see where you're coming from. I met one atheist, and he was willing to listen. And I went through the doctrines, took 10 weeks to do it, two hours each week, and he said, maybe, sounds good. He kept coming to church. He didn't commune, of course, I wouldn't commune. And then he called me up, he said, you're right. It was a day that I had preached my worst sermon and I felt ashamed of myself and I said, well, thank God, somebody got something out of me. Oh no, he's, that was a terrible sermon. <laughs> he said, but when you prayed, the Holy Spirit touched me and told me it's all true. A footnote, about five years later, he became a pastor in our church. 
Yes. He found his peace, and his peace, I so say, found him. Now, when the gospel is believed in part of the household and not the other, the other side takes offense. I don't know if you've ever met any Jewish Christians. I have a few. And they've all said the same thing. Once I accepted Christ as my Savior, I was no longer allowed to be a part of the family. Not even a telephone call would be received. One of my close friends, Manya Horowitz by name, he had the first grandson born to that clan. And the grandparents would not even acknowledge it. Now on the other hand, Muslims aren't worried about expelling Christians when, they, when their family members of become Christians. They don't expel them, they kill them. Now that doesn't speak of all Muslims, of course there are those who don't go along with that. If you watch Fox News every once in a while, a real nice Muslim a guy with a doctor's degree, I can't say his name, but he tells us that, well, we need a reformation. In other words, if you really read the Quran, he doesn't believe it. But then there are some Christians who don't believe all the Bible either. <clears throat> Some people believe God is love. He's really going to take everybody into heaven. Maybe not Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or a few people like that, but everybody else is coming to heaven. And you say, but Jesus says, no one gets into heaven without me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> Wait a minute now, are you that narrow-minded? You mean to tell, well, my neighbor, he's an atheist and I like him. And he goes around, and, well, there's one neighbor of ours that is handicapped, and he cuts his grass. Are you willing to tell me that God is not going to accept him into heaven just because he doesn't believe in Jesus? Well, yeah, I'm going to say that. Well, you're narrow-minded. <coughs> yes, I am. What does Jesus say about that? Straight and what? Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. What about our fellow Christians when we say, you know, I don't really see anything wrong with a Christian taking a glass of wine now and again or a bottle of beer. You can't really mean that. Yes, I do. Well, then they become hostile about that. Because those kind of people, their religion is tied to total abstinence, not to Jesus. When I deal with Christians of other denominations, I find out what is most important. Most of them, thankfully, say, you know, as long as you believe in Jesus, you're on the right road. But some of them will say, boy, if you, if you drink, uh, no heaven for you. If you're not baptized by the Holy Spirit when you're an adult, no, no, no. If you're not immersed, no, no, no. If you don't go to church on Saturday, no, no, no. If you don't agree with me 100%, no, no, no. But thankfully, most other Christians understand the gospel. As one expert put it, on essentials of the Christian faith, Total agreement on non-essential tolerance. Well, enough stones thrown at others. What about ourselves? I have dealt with people, and you have too, when they're doing something wrong and you point it out to them. A lot of times they don't say, oh, thank you for saying that. They get mad at you. And sometimes when people leave the church because they're mad at you or they find some petty little thing that they don't like, and you say something, you meet them, and well, I met a couple of people in the grocery store from this, formerly from this congregation. Hi, you did. I don't have any time for you. Why? Because Jesus either gives you peace or he gives you a problem. And I'll speak for myself. When I'm not doing something nice or good, I don't have any peace. And I want to tell you something, that's a good thing. When you are doing something wrong and you feel good about it, somebody's got to control of your life and it's not the Holy Spirit. Now, the question we started with, is Jesus really the Prince of Peace? Well, listen to how St. John explains it. Jesus was in the world, though the world was made from him, for him, the world did not know him. He came into his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who received them, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. And again, Jesus came unto his own and he said, Peace be unto you. Notice, he didn't say it to the Pharisees. 
He didn't say it to the rulers of the people. He didn't say it to Herod. He didn't say it to Pilate. But he only says it to his own. Now the dilemma is that Jesus offers peace to his own, but those who don't accept the gospel find this troubling. It is not that Jesus withholds peace, it's that they refuse peace. And so he comes to you and he comes to me and he says, peace. Peace be unto you, not as the world gives, but as I give. What's the world's peace? Well, when you're healthy, happy, wise, everything is going your way, you feel great. But one little thing goes wrong and your world collapses. How did Luther put it? Take they our life, goods, fame, childhood, wife, those these all be gone, our victory has been won, the kingdom ours remaineth. We have that peace that passes all understanding. And that brings us back to last week's gospel. We need not worry, God is on our side. Not even a sparrow will fall to the ground without his knowledge and consent. He watches over us. How did David put it? Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise back up, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it all together. You go before me and behind me. You hem me in. You lay your hand upon me, oh Lord. Such knowledge is too wonderful. How can I perceive it? So I say to you, peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.